Okay, so the Fourier transform has two very beautiful properties, and these are used in in quantum algorithms. So let me uh, explain these two properties to you. The first property is is one that you probably know of as the convolution multiplication property of, of a Fourier transform. Okay, so let's say that this is our Fourier transform. It's n-dimensional. And now let's say that our input superposition is alpha naught, alpha 1 through alpha n minus 1. And our output is beta naught through beta n minus 1. Okay, so so in other words, what we are saying is if we start with this state and we apply the Fourier transform to it, we get we get that state. So now what does this mean? Well, remember what we intend to do is do Fourier sampling. So we take this output state, we measure it, and what do we see? Well, what we get to see is some index j with probability beta sub j magnitude squared. Okay, so now let's do a slightly different experiment. So we again use a quantum Fourier transform. But now we take our input and we rotate it. We shift it. So we shift it cyclically. So, so we shift everything down one step, alpha naught, alpha 1, alpha n minus 1. And then we wrap around. So alpha n goes up here. So what do you expect to see on this side? The first entry is easy, right? You'd still see beta naught. So what, what would the next entry look like? Well, in the next entry, instead of seeing beta 1, everything is shifted by omega. Right? So what you see is omega times beta 1. Similarly, the next entry that you see is not beta 2, but everything is again shifted by omega squared. So you see omega squared times beta 2. And so on, until you get to the end and you get omega to the n minus 1 times beta n minus 1. Okay, make sure you see why this happens. So, so let's let's go over again this the second entry in detail. What do you get? Well, well, you see omega times alpha naught plus omega squared times alpha one and so on, instead of one times alpha naught, omega times alpha one and so on. So everything has been shifted by omega, except now you see one times alpha n instead of omega to the n minus one times alpha n. But you see. When you multiply omega to the n minus 1 by omega, you wrap around and you come to 1. So, so everything works out fine. OK, so what happened here? Well, what happened is you shifted the input. And the output basically remained the same, except that we picked up a phase on each of these, each of these amplitudes. Now, what's the, so, so remember, omega, omega squared, all these are roots of unity. They have magnitude 1. So now, when we actually do a measurement, the probability of seeing any particular index is the square of the magnitude of the corresponding complex number. But omega has magnitude 1, so it drops out of this whole thing. And so you still see j with probability beta sub j magnitude squared. So what's, what's the moral of all this? Well, the moral is that if what you're planning to do is Fourier sampling, then any way you shift your input superposition is not going to make any difference to the output probability distribution. OK, so that's property number one of the quantum Fourier transform. Here's the second property. OK, so the next beautiful property that Fourier transforms have is that they treat periodic functions in a very special way. So let's assume we are doing a quantum Fourier transform of m dimensions. 
And let's start with this function, so this function of j, alpha j, and let's say it's periodic. So what this means, and it's period r, so what this means is that amplitudes go alpha naught, alpha 1 through alpha r minus 1, and then they repeat again, so they go again as alpha naught, alpha 1 through alpha r minus 1, and so on and so forth. They, repeat, they keep repeating up through m, so let's think of r as dividing m, possibly. And now, when we do the quantum Fourier transform, mod m, we get another periodic function. So the amplitudes are periodic. And if we plot it out, j versus beta j, then these, the period is m over r. And so if we write it out, then it's beta naught, beta 1 through beta m over r. And then we repeat beta naught, beta 1 through beta m over r and so on. Okay, so that's what the quantum Fourier transform does on a, on a periodic function. Okay, so now what we are going to do is we are going to prove, we are going to deal with a special case of this, and we'll actually show that this property of the quantum Fourier transform holds in the special case. Okay, so what's the special case that we are interested in? So let's plot it out. Let's, let's say we have j versus alpha j. And now alpha j is periodic, but it with period r, so but it'll have non-zero values only at zero, r, two r, and all the way to m over r minus one times r. Okay, or if you want it's m minus r. Okay, so those are the only non-zero amplitudes are at, are at these multiples of r. Okay, so let, let's see how many such multiples of r are there. There are exactly m over r of them. And so if you want to normalize and make this a unit vector, the amplitude of each of these non-zero components should be square root of 1 over m over r, which is square root of r over m. Okay, so now what does the quantum Fourier transform mod m do to this superposition? Okay, so what it does, now it maps it to a new superposition on beta j's. And in fact, this new superposition is also periodic, but now its period is m over r. So the non-zero amplitudes are at multiples of m over r, and they're exactly r of them. So they go from 0, m over r, 2 m over r, and so on, to r minus 1 times m over r. And... So since they are exactly r of them, the amplitude of each one should be 1 over square root of r. Okay, so let's, let's write this out in vector notation now. So we have our, our input vector. So there's this normalization factor, square root r over m. And then the entries are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then we start with 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so on, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, but what's the distance between these successive ones? It's exactly r. Okay, and now when we perform a quantum Fourier transform on this superposition, what do we get? Okay, so we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. Okay, and um, the distance between the successive ones is now m over r, so that's the new period. And the normalization factor, of course, is 1 over square root r because they are, they are exactly r uh, non-zero entries, r entries which are 1 in the vector. Okay, so now let's rewrite this initial state in the ket notation. So we rewrite it as summation j equal to 0 to m over r minus 1 of... Um, j times r, so this is the multiples of r, but now we have this normalization factor of square root of r over m. Okay, so that's our initial superposition in ket notation, and now when we form the qu quantum Fourier transform mod m, we get a new superposition, let's call it summation beta sub j, j, j going from 0 to m minus 1. And now we, we want to figure out what does beta j look like? Okay, so let's first figure out 
what beta j looks like when j is a multiple of m over r. So let's figure out what's beta sub k times m over r. Okay, so let's write out our expression. Beta sub k times m over r is what? Well, you get a contribution from every part of the superposition you start with. So how much does it get? Well, for each of these get jrs, it gets a, gets, a, gets a contribution, which is 1 over square root m times the amplitude, which is square root r over m, times a phase, which is omega to the power of the product of these, the numbers in the kets. So you'll get square root of r over m times 1 over square root m, which is a normalization factor of Fourier transform, times omega to the power of jr times k times m over r. Okay, now, what's the point here? Well, the point here is that the r's cancel, and so what you get is omega to some multiple of m, but omega to the m is 1, so you get a, you know, all the contributions are going to be equal, and so they're exactly m over r of them, so you get m over r times square root r over m, which, which is just 1 over square root r. Okay, so... Let me, let me sort of describe what happened here. Well, you see, so, you know, what any component of the Fourier transform, like we are looking at the km over r component, what it does is the phase keeps precessing at some rate. Well, rate proportional to the coefficient we are looking at, which is k times m over r. Okay, so now what's happening? Well, what we've done is we've, we are doing a Fourier transform of a periodic function, and the period is such that every time we pick up the phase, the phase is exactly one. And so we are getting constructive interference, right? We are hitting this. It's, you know, the phase is rotating, but, you know, every time we hit it, we are hitting it in the same place. And so we get completely constructive interference. And so that, that happens at these multiples of m over r. But now how many such multiples of m over r are there? Well, there's, there's exactly r of them. And so together these components of 1, you know, already the norm of the vector is 1, the, the, sum, the length squared is 1. And so the rest of the components for beta j, for j not equal to, not a multiple of m over r, they must all be zeros. Okay, so we've figured out the output superposition completely. But now, if you wanted to, you could also figure out what beta j is for j not a multiple of m over r explicitly. And so what you would do is you would write out the expression as before, but now the phase would no longer cancel out. In fact, you're not catching it at the same point in the phase every time. And in fact, the phase keeps precessing. And so if you look at all these components, what happens is the phases are, you know, are symmetrically distributed around the circle. And so when you add up all these vectors, you get zero. So you get completely destructive interference. And so beta j is zero whenever j is not a multiple of m over r. Okay, so here's, here's the moral of all this. This property of the quantum Fourier transform that it treats periodic functions in this very special way, this, is, this has to do with constructive and destru destructive interference. Constructive interference happens at these multiples of m over r and destructive interference at all the other points. And, okay, so this is the property of quantum Fourier transforms, which will play a very central role in, in our quantum algorithm for factoring.